Do you watch online poker? If you do, you'll know that there's one must-have skill that every pro has or they wouldn't stand the chance at the tables. And with trading being so similar to poker, you'll think that every aspiring trader would have this skill too. But surprisingly, most don't. Hi, Mike Bellafieri, co-founder of SMB Capital, a proprietary trading firm located in New York City. Founded in 2005, SMB Capital trades stocks and options and futures and crypto, both as discretionary and automated traders. In this video, Lance Breitstein, the number one trader at a tier one prop firm in back-to-back -back years, reveals the must-have trading skill that every pro has. And it's so important that we can't even imagine trading without having this skill. In fact, if you don't have it, you're probably just flailing around as a trader thinking that you're getting somewhere. So to avoid that, in this video, we're gonna dive deep into this topic and cover all of the ins and outs so you can have the best chance possible to become a consistently profitable trader. Let's get to it. Today I'm going to be discussing expected value dynamics. This is an advanced topic and one of my favorite and I think one of the most important things that I'm going to be stressing over the next couple of months. This is a detail that I think took me from great to elite because every single trade incorporates the skill. You can follow me on Twitter at the one Lance B. So first to get into this topic we're going to take a field trip to the poker table. Poker is amazing because it has so many great analogies to trading that we're now going to delve into. All right, 10-9 against Balan's ace-queen, and there's an ace! Yes! John Robert loves the call now. Come on, no jacks, please. No jacks and no sevens. No jacks, no sevens, and I don't need any more pairs. No jacks, no sevens, and he doesn't need any more pairs. <laughs> Deuce ball. It's a six. That's the card I'm talking about. Not over about. yet, John Robert. Did I tell you that you look very handsome today, so sir? John Robert, and you can still hit a seven. We're coping with a straight draw. <laughs> Ballon thought it was over. <laughs> Almost, John Robert. John Robert, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> bye bye. Uh, Copian thinks he's going to hit the four outer. Don't do it to me like that. That would be ugly. Copian needs a seven for a straight to knock out Jean Robert. River card. Oh! Is a seven. <laughs> oh, is, is gone. Let's dissect a little bit what we saw in that video. So initially, before the flop, the one player had a two uh, two thirds probability of of winning, right? But then, once the flop appears, what happens? Those odds change, right? It's not static odds throughout the whole poker hand. So once the flop changes, you need to recalibrate based on the new info. Once you get the pair of aces, his odds went to a near lock, but it still wasn't over yet. Then finally on the river, there was a total reversal. So the point of this is to show that all throughout that hand, as you can even see by the, the percentages up on the screen, in poker, players are constantly adapting to how those odds are unfolding. And while both these, you know, while the, this hand was all in, your betting style and your decision to whether or not to stay in a hand needs to be constantly assessed throughout. So why do I love poker analogies so much? The beauty of poker is that it's a simplified but very similar game to trading. And unlike in trading, true odds can be calculated. Everything is also an extremely finite universe of outcomes. You know how many outs you have, you know how many cards are left in the deck, so it's very easy to calculate this. Whereas with trading, there's a very broad spectrum oftentimes of what can, can occur. And the other beauty of poker is that it also has similar psychology dynamics and betting dynamics. FOMO, tilt, all these things we constantly struggle with as traders, much like poker players. And similarly, we need to know, when should we be betting more? I'm constantly harping on exponential bet sizing and that the better hand you get, the better hand you need to, the more you need to bet, just like in poker. The other thing is, in poker and in trading, you're constantly acting under uncertainty and you need to constantly recalibrate as those odds are changing. As every hand unfolds, you have the decision to either bet, fold, check, or call. And so throughout that, like every single tell is being analyzed by these players. You need to know, 
what's the other bet size? What are these tell you know? What are these players talking about? What are these cards uh, that could help them, and what are their potential hands? And so this is really no different, but very very few recognize this and are constantly calibrating like we need to be. And in trading, every single second, every single bar that elapses, we need to be changing with it. If you want to learn three more real-world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders, and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven-figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing now at the top right-hand corner of your screen. That will open up the free registration page in a new window, so don't worry, you won't lose this video. You can also visit tradingworkshop.com to register for this free intensive workshop. You're gonna learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. Now let's go full trading on this. EV or expected value is a mix of risk, reward, and probability. All three of these variables change for every single detail that elapses. These nuances include the box, the chart pattern development, the overall market action, the market environment you're trading in, and specifics to your trading strategy. All of those are influencing those three variables. So your decisions must be updating along this. So now I'm gonna get down into the nitty gritty. And remember guys, this is an advanced topic. This is not for traders that are still getting the basics down. So we're gonna dissect a simple breakout example. Uh, this was an MSTR on, on August 3rd of, of 22. And on the daily chart, there was a $300 breakout, and this is the intraday in which we consolidate up against that resistance, and then we break out on both the intraday and the daily. So for the purposes of this video and this first example, we're doing a very, very, very simple system. We're going to assume you buy the break of 300, and your stop loss is, is roughly that prior bar low of 298. And then we're gonna pick an arbitrary target of 325. Again, guys, I know people are gonna say, oh, that, that target's random, this is random. I'm just doing a very, very simple example so you all can work with me on this one. What I do now is I break down the expected value in bars A, B, and C. So in bar A, uh, if we're buying 300, our reward to our 325 target is $25. Our risk to our $298 stop is $2. And I really just kind of made up and approximated uh, a 30% win rate. Again, guys, not very scientific. I'm just doing this for example sake to prove my point for now. And so what you get is that in, in bar A, there is a $6.10 expected value. And I do actually think this trade is a pretty strong trade. And, and I don't think these assumed variables are, are really too far off. And so now we jump to bar B. So now, it's showing continued strength. The breakout's going great. We had really great volume. So I would say as we get closer to that 325, the probability of, of us reaching there is actually increasing. So now I give us roughly a 60% win rate. So you might think, oh wow, like our, our, our expected value is getting better. But that's not necessarily true. Because here's the thing. Now at 310, our reward versus 325 is only an incremental 15 bucks, but meanwhile our risk if this, plays, if this play fails is a full $12 um, down to that, that 298 level. So when you calculate that EV, you get $4.20. Still strongly positive and worth holding, but it's worth noting that as this play worked in our favor, the expected value started to decrease. And now we're gonna jump to bar C as we get very close to that target. So because we're so close, really just five bucks away now, I'm giving it a 75% probability. Maybe it's a little bit, bit higher, but again, just, just ballparking. So from 320, the reward is five bucks away, but now what happened is uh, our risk is, is potentially 20 bucks or actually the, uh, you know, I'm kind of ballparking, rounding the numbers. Um, and so now your expected value has actually turned negative. What does this highlight here, right? So what this example is showing you is that as this trade is working in your favor and you're getting closer and closer to your target, the trade's actually getting less and less positively skewed and more negative as you approach that because your risk increases and the rewards decreasing. What would that mean for me as a trader? First of all, that would mean if these, if these estimations are accurate, I probably want to get most or all my size at bar A 
where the expected value is highest. A lot of traders wait for confirmation, and that confirmation, again, the win rate might be higher, but that doesn't necessarily mean the expected value is higher as well. And I think that's such a huge nuance for many traders. So people will buy in bar B where the win rate's 60% because the trade's working, but they're not recognizing that they're actually lowering the overall expected value of the trade. And so then by bar C where the expected value is turned negative, what that means is you actually don't want any stock on by then. So in practical terms, I might be getting all my size at bar A and then slowly starting to scale out as we approach bar C and getting less exposure as we get closer. And intuitively, this actually makes a lot of sense as well. So now we're going to complicate things a little bit away from the simple breakout. And what we're going to look at is a reversion example, mean reversion that is. And we're going to do GME on August 8th, 2022, and this is an intraday reversal short. So again, I'm going to simplify this, guys. You know, don't, don't go nuts over my assumptions. It's just, just to make this easy. And so on this opening drive, we go, from, we go from 41 to a high of 48. And so I use, in this case, the moving average as a, as a target at roughly 42.50. Uh, why do I do this? Because if you had the daily chart, you'd see this is really, really extended overall. Uh, this is a, a multi-day up move at this point. It was a huge inflow on this. So I, th I think for this one, uh, the moving average for me would have been pretty appropriate for my system. Uh, the entry for this, again, for example's sake, but but pretty similar to what I'd actually do. I'm looking for a break of the prior bar low. In this case, this occurs at roughly $45. And what I would be doing is I would be doing a trailing stop uh, as this play progresses, and the stop is the high of the prior bar. So now let's dive into the expected values on these. So first, let's look at bar A. So here in bar A, we haven't yet turned yet. We haven't broken prior bar lows. Still, to me, I would consider this fighting the trend. There's a time and place for it, but just for exa example's sake, I'm going to argue this has a 30% win rate that you're going to actually catch the top. Um, but the, the reward is actually the greatest on this. Uh, so we might be seeing as much as $5 of reward, uh, and I even you know, kind of do an arbitrary $3 of risk. Again, just using some basic assumptions to make this work. Um, but they are roughly what I would assume makes sense. So this would have a negative expected value of about 60 cents. Again, we're fighting the trend. That makes our win rate pretty, pretty poor here, uh, which really dings that expected value a lot. So now in bar B, this is where we actually break the prior bar lows. And so for my system, this would be the true, true entry there that I would first consider. But there's one issue. The prior bar highs, which is my stop here, is actually really far away because this pattern unfolded in a very rangy matter. So if I were to take my stop of, of that prior bar high at 48 bucks, my risk is actually a full $3 per share, and my reward is only to 42.50, leaving $2.50 of upside. But because I'm now with the trend, I do think this is more probable than not, which gives me just, just a modest positive expected value of 30 cents. So not great, not so awful. Maybe I initiate here for, for small size. But what's interesting to highlight now is the way this pattern unfolds is we now look at bar C. And what happens in bar C is we actually uh, go quite close to that prior bar high in B. And so this allows me a much, much tighter entry based on my system. Again, just talking my system, uh, that prior bar B was too rangy compared to A, but now I have a beautiful, beautiful candle wick that gets me close to those highs that are gonna be my stop. So often I'll initiate or add there because this bar C wick is actually offering me a better expected value than any prior place in the trade. And when I calculate that based on my assumptions, uh, I'm assuming a little bit lower win rate just because it is coming back up against that bar, which is, shows somewhat strength. Uh, but I do think these, again, are, are roughly accurate, giving me an expected value of 70 cents. Now we jump to bar D. This also is unfolding in a pretty tight manner. And what we're seeing, which is so often the case, is we're starting to stair step lower. And so within the bars, we're kind of rangy, but we're still holding that trend, which tends to happen on, on really nice plays. And so again, with D, I can short pretty close to those prior bar highs. The reward isn't as enticing anymore, and this ends up with an expected value of about 50 cents, so still positive and worth holding. Now finally, we get to bar E. Really, at this point, we're quite 
quite close to that target, so very high win rate. But at this point, the reward's limited, right? There's not that much meat on the bone. And the issue, though, is in bar E, my stop of the prior bar highs is now really far away. My risk is a buck fifty, while the reward is only fifty cents. This is where I start to think: Should I be taking this trade off? And if you think about those probabilities, um, it, you come to the conclusion that yeah, it's getting pretty marginal to negative now. And in fact, this is where I would be taking off that trade. So, what are the other considerations we need to make? throughout this. So to be clear, I am not actually crunching the exact expected value calculations when I'm trading. There's no real hardcore calculations. These prior calculations are just to make a point. In reality, the hardest part of this exercise is so often handicapping what your probability spectrum is and what your reward is. And where does that come from? A lot of that needs to come from experience. Yesterday at SMB, a trader asked me, where, where, where do I get these, these numbers from and, and is it all from backtesting? And I wish it could be, but the issue is so many times all these trades are so nuanced. How do you compare a trade like HKD or, or AMTD the past week to some prior comparable when there is no precedent? Every single thing has differences in volume, the box, the intraday, the daily. So what we do as traders is it's our job to use our mental database or an Evernote database to really handicap these the best we can. They're all estimations at the end of the day, but part of being a trader is having the most accurate estimations versus the market. So the other thing is a lot of traders miss a lot of nuances. We really do want to be incorporating elements on the tape, like a buyer coming in, or things that, you know, that which might both increase the probability of your long working and the reward. Or similarly, you could run into a large seller in front of resistance. That might lead one to sell under him with the option of them buying back once their seller lifts. One needs to be making these decisions through a rough estimation of what the expected value is, which is dynamically changing on all of these factors. Similarly, certain patterns might start off amazing but unfold in a manner that ruins it, the same way pocket aces can be awful after the flop. So there's always the counter view. Some traders might argue, oh, let the, let the trade work and let it be binary. And I would argue that this is just stubborn and not taking advantage of all the information we can have as a day trader. It's very close-minded and the same as saying like to a poker player. If you get aces, just play it, just play it straight through until, until the end. That would be awful, awful advice. There's so many times where aces lose, and depending on others' betting style and what unfolds on, on the flop, the turn, and the river, you really need to be incorporating that information. The only situations I can think of where that argument might be valid is if your data supports it. If for whatever reason, incorporating these nuances proves to be negative expected value for you, or if there are certain trades, especially on big picture time frames, that require you to be hands off, then I get it. But otherwise, I would argue you just simply don't yet have the experience and the skill set yet to accurately incorporate these different, different nuances. But that does not mean that you shouldn't be striving to do so or that it wouldn't help your trading. So what if none of this made sense to you? Again, this is an advanced topic. Just watch the video again, take time to think about it, or just come back to the idea in the future. It's a hugely, hugely important one, something that I'm going to be focusing a lot of my advice on in the future. And so here's my challenge to you now. I want you to reflect on your trading and think about what are some nuances you can begin to incorporate in your trading. Maybe it's figuring out how can you rate the box on a scale of negative 10 for being bearish or 10 for being bullish and start to incorporate that into your trade decisions. If you're long into a super, super nice, steady, strong bullish box, maybe you, want, you don't want to sell as aggressively. Or if something's looking bearish despite you being long, maybe you start to audible and start to scale out of it. Beyond the box, maybe you're going to start to further dissect nuances in the intraday chart or the daily chart. Perhaps your goal is going to be to incorporate the strength or weakness of the, the closing of each intraday bar. You don't need to go all at once. Just pick some small nuance and make sure you're starting to dynamically incorporate that into your expected value. This is a very, very tough skill, but this will elevate your trading. And this is the objectively optimal, mathematically optimal way to be doing this. It is what will make you better if you take the time to do this. So any questions, as always, reach out. But again, before you do so, rewatch the video, take time, and only then ask away. This is a hard topic. Once you do so, 
I'll try to help you out the best I can. And as I always say, then let's get the F back to work. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they are producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB. Train and trade well.